presenter here tonight, somebody who's one of our official partners when it comes to college recruitment. And uh, I hope you get a, a lot out of this session tonight. Uh, a couple of housekeeping items tonight. So what we thought we'd do is, in terms of questions, you may have questions as we go along, and we don't want to sort of interrupt the flow of the presentation that Carter's going to put forth tonight, but what we thought is, you know what, why don't you send a quick email to that address there. Uh, okay, so it's tm at onrecruitable.com. And so then when we, when we, when Tari concludes tonight, he'll sort of address your questions in order, and then we can ask, a, uh, you can ask other questions as well. Okay, so not completely necessary if you want to wait. Um, obviously, if there's something you really want to hash out, feel free to put up your hand. As I mentioned, there's rings at the back. Um, really no structure in terms of you coming up and throw the washroom. Washroom will help that door to the right side. Um, any questions before we begin? Okay, just a couple of other things. So just wanted you to get to know some of the OK staff. I recognize a lot of faces, but there's some here I don't recognize. It's actually quite good to see. Normally, when I speak to parents or players, it's, uh, it's not always a good thing. Sometimes it's a healthy debate about rankings or other issues, or <laughs> better structure, or are your kids getting coded or thrown out, or, or you're getting thrown out as a parent, right? So this is actually pretty good. Uh, it might be the start of something, guys. Uh, at the back of the room, we've got uh, Ziad, who looks after um, many parts of the computer structure, but primarily the rankings for OTA and Canada. Ziad? Hi, everybody. Then, yeah, you can clap if you want. Yeah. <laughs> And everybody knows Andrew <coughs> Chappell, who is going overseas in competitive structure as well. Andrew Chappell. <laughs> and uh, our marketing manager, who took the time out of his business schedule to be here tonight to help set this place up and do a great job, Peter Matheson. <laughs> okay, I'll hand it over to Tarek. I've uh, known Tarek since he was a junior. Well, I used to run tournaments at the old All Canadian facility, and Tarek was a competitive player in the OTA structure. So we go a long way back, and uh, Tarek has uh, created a very nice business for himself based out of Florida, and uh, we sort of kept the lines of communication open. And uh, he came on board as a partner a couple of years ago, and he's done some great work with trying to play some of our junior players. And uh, you know, I'm not here to really push his service, but this is a great way for you to get some information out of it. And beyond that, it's up to you as to how far you want to be with Tarek as a, as a partner or as a, as a client. Okay, thank you for coming tonight, and uh, I think his presentation will take about an hour, and then we've got time for questions. Okay, thank you. Thanks. I'm going to use the mic. Is that okay so everyone can hear clearly? I don't have the big booming voice like Kardec. So good evening, everyone. Again, thanks to the OTA. We're here today. So I just want to give it up one more time for the whole OTA staff. I just turned the lights off with my phone at my apartment in Miami. And what that means is that technology has changed our lives. It's changed everything that we're doing today. Changed the way we communicate, changes the way we interact, we collect and transfer information, and it certainly has changed the recruiting process. So everybody here today is with us to learn more about the college tennis recruiting process. And uh, in 2002, I was in my dorm room at St. Andrews College, where I went to school as a boarder, and I was trying to send a tape, a VHS tape, to a college coach. This kid right here is looking at me like, what the heck is a VHS tape? <laughs> Right? Or does he know? The point is that we've come a long way in these last 14, 15 years. And the way that recruiting works today is completely different than it worked five years ago, 10 years ago, 15 years ago. So I want to give you guys a great overview of the recruiting process, what it is today in 2016 and how you guys can navigate that, how you can be successful and create a winning game plan so that you can be successful at your goals and pursue your dreams. So everybody was given a piece of paper and uh, on that paper, if you can refer to it, I talk about the five things you need to know and the seven steps you need to take. So tonight what I'm gonna do in my 
45 minutes to an hour is, is try to go through that as best I can and give you guys as much information and knowledge that you can take in and start to understand the process. The first thing I'm gonna tell you though is that you will not learn everything there is tonight. It takes a long time to learn the recruiting process and you have to be indulged in it and you have to work at it and everybody's process is slightly different. So I hope this will be a great start, educational start. For some of you who have maybe heard me speak before or have attended some of our events may have learned some things, so I still hope that you're gonna learn something new as well. So let's get started with this. All right, so number one, the recruiting process starts in grade nine, okay? What do I mean by that? Everyone who usually goes through the recruiting process in the past says, you know, I'll do it in my grade 11 year, I'll start during my senior year. Well, today, it's totally different. Players can commit as early as the beginning of their senior year, which is their 12th grade year. They can commit to a college and sign a national letter of intent, which is a signature on the paper saying you're going to that college, which is in November, which is actually happening right now. And so that means that your recruiting process must have started well before that. A year, two years in advance. Players need to learn everything there is about college recruiting, and so do parents. You need to understand the different types of schools. You need to understand what level of tennis player you need to be to get to that type of school. You need to know the academic criteria and requirements you need to attend the schools that you're interested in. And you need to know what schools you are interested in. You know, which school is gonna be best for you. There's over a thousand universities in the United States that offer athletics. And there's roughly 900 that offer women's tennis and there's about 800 that offer men's tennis. And that number changes a little bit, but that gives you guys a really good idea. And so, how do you determine which is the right school for you? So, if you're even gonna shut your brain off for the rest of the night, if you can think, if you can remember one thing, and one thing only, that would be learning the process and educating yourself is gonna help you you know, get to the next level. So, the learning process starts in grade nine. And what a player really needs to do is they need to be looking at colleges. They need to be indulging themselves in the United States programs where there's camps and exposure opportunities, where you can go and see some colleges, where you can do some research online, where you can meet some coaches at some camps. There's many, many things you can do in order to help prepare yourself for that process. You also need to make some short and long-term goals. And so, as a tennis player, if you say that you want to be at, let's say, the University of North Carolina, four years from now, if this is as you're starting grade nine, you need to know what level of tennis you need to be at and what academic grades you need. And if you don't know already, colleges look at your grades from nine to 12 every single year. So if you're going into grade 11 or 12 thinking, you know, I'm just gonna get really good grades right now, I mean, that's gonna be tough to increase your GPA or in Canada, like your percentage, your average score, if you're just trying to do that in your final year. What are you gonna do if you didn't do it in your first couple years? Tennis is not a game that you can just develop the skills in a year or two. We all know how difficult the game of tennis is. We know how much skill is required to be a good tennis player. We know the amount of tournaments that you need to play in the amount of dedication and time you need to put in to your on-court and off-court training in order to play at a high skill level. And so your goals need to be set up on the tennis court as well. If, if you're not setting short-term goals every quarter 
on your ability of, to play tennis and, and where you feel like your ranking can be or should be and, and what types of exercises you can do and how you can elevate your game and evaluate that every quarter, then you're not really setting yourself up for success. And it's funny because most people don't do that. I didn't do that. But with, with technology today, with the ability to have statistics, tournaments, opportunity, we should be able to do that. So we should be able to have some goals that we set every quarter and try to achieve them and evaluate them. And if we didn't achieve them, why didn't we achieve them? Where did we go wrong or where do we need to improve to get to that level? Knowing what the long-term goal is. So I think that's very, very important. And the recruiting process can help you with that a lot. It can help you a lot with that a lot because there are information and tools out there now that I'll get into later in the presentation that will help you understand where you need to be and that can help you evaluate your level as you're moving along. So, second point I made was technology drives the recruiting process. You know, as I mentioned earlier, I was sending a VHS tape in 2002, and today your video is going up on YouTube, Vimeo, you're sending an email, possibly even to me, with a question. It just shows how quickly college coaches can receive information. And it also says another thing. It says how many more people can reach college coaches. So when I was in college, there were some internationals, but there weren't a lot. Now when you look at the dynamics of college tennis, specifically because tennis is an international game, you see a ton of internationals. You see kids from places you never even heard of because you didn't know that they, could, they had a way to communicate. You have kids in India, China, places in, that you wouldn't think have technology, but they have more phones in those countries than we do here in Canada and in the United States. They have access to that. So they are also able to get in front of college coaches. And I think it's really important to understand how to use technology to your advantage, but also understand how much bigger the competition has grown because of that. So if you're not the first person to check your phone and to jump on an email, well, the coach may be going somewhere else. And I say that, you know, respectfully in, 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 in theory, is that, you know, if as the competition grows, you know, coaches want to find players that are hungry, players that want it, players that are able to communicate with them, and we really have no excuse now because you pretty much got a phone glued to your, to your pants. So there's no, there's no chance for you not to do it. The third point I make over here is be realistic about your opportunities. Less than 1% of athletes get a Division I full ride. A full ride means everything paid for. Let me talk for a second about the scholarship opportunities that are available. In men's tennis, on, in Division I, there's four and a half scholarships that they divide among six, eight, 10, 12 players, however many they have on their roster. Roster size normally doesn't go past 12 players. On the women's side, there's eight, but they're a headcount sport. So a headcount sport means that they have to offer a full scholarship to every single girl that they're recruiting, which means they can have a roster size of eight. In Division Two, the men's side will have, again, four and a half to divide against the players. On the women's side, they have six. So over there, they don't have a head count. So they can divide that however they like. Generally, teams will give full, six, full scholarships and have six on their team. Some will divide it up a little bit, but there's always opportunity there for a full scholarship. On Division Three, there aren't any scholarships. Division Three gives financial aid. And so a lot of people say, oh, you know, I'm not going to go Division Three because there's no money there. It's kind of hard to say that because there are often times, depending on your family's financial situation, where you might get more money at a Division Three versus a Division One or Two. 
Has anybody here heard of NAIA? NAIA. NAIA. The League NAIA. Okay, NAIA is another association that you should get yourself familiar with. There's quite a few schools there that offer scholarships that can help you get into college, and there's some very good colleges. In fact, there's some good Canadians here that I helped work with that are at a school called Missouri Valley College, which is a great NAIA school. And I think it's really important to understand that those schools that are in that league have opportunities as well. I'm going to talk a little bit more about NAI and NCAA as we go through the steps as well. So for those of you who do not familiar with NCAA even and what that means, I will, I will touch, touch upon that. But going back to the scholarship amounts and the realistic opportunities, we have to understand that there's a lot of competition for those spots. And so when I say eight full scholarships on the D1 side for girls, that does not mean that every school is fully funded with those eight scholarships. There's a small percentage that are. So a school can have anywhere from eight to seven to six, 6.2, five, three, it all depends. So there is opportunity on the girls' side to get that full ride but there's not every school is funded. So you are competing for those few spots. On the guys' side, there really isn't full rides anymore. That terminology is almost non-existent. And the reason for that is that, you know, when I was in college, there was some schools willing to give their number one player a full scholarship or number one and two player. But what happens is that when you give them all the money, it doesn't leave enough for the rest of the team. And everybody's looking for some sort, of fine, some sort of aid or scholarship. And that results in slightly weaker team. And the depth drops. And so in order for your team to be competitive, you need to be able to spread the money out so everybody gets some. And of course, your top one, two, three players may get a little bit more. But at least you have a deeper team and you have a better chance to compete for a conference title, a championship, a national championship. And so there's an opportunity then for players to get academic scholarships, to couple in with the athletic so that they can get a combination scholarship. And a lot of players, majority of players, are getting the combination scholarship. So that again tells you how important the academics are. And most colleges on the academic side have some sort of a scale. And so they'll look at a, at a, at a potential applicant for the university and say, okay, you have a 3.5 GPA, and so in Canadian terms, we might say a 90% overall average, and you got a 1,200 on your SAT, okay? And I'll talk about SAT if anyone doesn't know about that, but just um, there, and, and you're gonna see based on that, that there's different scales of scholarships they'll give. So 3.5, 1,200 might give you $3,500. I'm throwing a number out there. But maybe a 3.0 in 1,000 is going to get you $2,500. And so most colleges that offer academic scholarships have some sort of scale where they can give you that money. And then there may be other opportunities like international scholarships or you may qualify for other stuff. But in order for you to qualify, your grades need to be excellent. And tennis? I don't know, but everybody seems to be really good and really smart when it comes to college. You know, I, I, I come across players that are often very, very good tennis-wise, and they say, well, I'm top 50 ITF. I'm like, well, how are your grades? Not very good? Well, you're not going to Stanford. You're not going to UCLA. You're not going to Georgia. You're not going to the schools that you may want to go to because your level is there, but because they got other kids that are going to get in academically and who actually are top 50 and get the grades. And so then you ask yourself, well, how is that possible? Like, you know, how am I supposed to be traveling and playing tennis and, and, and homeschooling and then get the grades and play tennis? Well, it's called time management. It's called hard work, it's called dedication, it's called skills that you have to develop and build. And so if you're in the room thinking, you know, that's, that can't be possible, it is. It's very possible. And there's a ton of kids out there doing it. So I think it's very important to understand your realistic opportunities. Where are you? Where are you against the world? And it's very, very competitive. So I don't want to 
I don't want anybody to be discouraged. I want you to be motivated. I want you to feel like you can do it because you can, because there are other kids doing it. So if you're not one of those kids, you know, again, maybe setting some goals and getting yourself up to par, that's, that's what you need to do. That's the goals you need to set. And so when it comes to scholarships and money is, you know, can a various levels of play get into college and enjoy the amazing college rewarding experience of playing being a student athlete can you do that and is there a range absolutely absolutely you do not have to be top 10 in canada you do not have to be top 20 in the ota you don't you have to have some sort of competition level definitely and have to be very good but can you get him no you just different maybe level and that also comes then with a different scholarship right and that goes to say that you know if you're trying to get into a college that's trying to recruit you and you're going to come in and be a four five six player meaning in the one to six lineup there's six players that play in the lineup and you're going to come in there and, and play towards the bottom of the lineup why is the coach going to give you as much money as their number one or two it's just not going to happen so there will be some schools that will give you a higher scholarship where you might play in the top three in the lineup because that's what your value is at that time. And that's where you have to start evaluating you know, where your options are. Is, I'm gonna answer a question that someone probably already has because I get this a lot. You know, I don't want to play one or two on my team. I don't want to play one or two. I want to work my way in the lineup. Okay, that's great, but you know, it also depends on, on the scholarship and what you're gonna get. Plus, why wouldn't you wanna be one or two, right? Well, people have this idea in their mind that if they're one or two on the team, that they're not gonna improve. It's not true. Most teams, as I mentioned, because they're dividing scholarships, have depth, and there will be players on the team that you can compete with. But moreover, you should be looking at the competition your daily competition in match play. Who, which teams are you playing and what are the level of their one and two players? They may be great competition for you. They may really help you improve. And so although practice is very important and having good competition, as long as you have that, somebody's gotta be number one. So, you know, you gotta take that a little bit with a grain of salt. But your opportunities come, you know, depending on, on, on where you fit. And so as you go through this process right now of, of hearing what I have to say, and as you start indulging yourself in the recruiting process yourself, you're gonna realize where you need to be, what you need to do, and what types of opportunities are there. There's really no other way, you know, Another thing that people often come to me and say is, is you know, can you just do it for me? It's not, the, it's not the process. College coaches want to hear and talk to students. They want to talk to students. They do not want to talk to me about you. They don't want to talk to your parents about you. They're recruiting you. And so although it may be difficult for some people to get in front of a coach, communicate with them, really know what to say, you have people like me, organizations like ours, that can help you and guide you and give you the tools that you need and prepare you, but we can't do the work for you. And truthfully, you're not really gonna know what's best fit for you until you truthfully indulge yourself in, in it and put in the work and start figuring out where you fit because everybody's different so it's it's not easy it takes a lot of time and that's why i said it starts in grade nine and if you're one of those people right now that is in grade 10 11 12 I'm not saying it's impossible i'm trying to give you guys the information about how much you may need to catch up in order 
to be successful. And it is possible. There's kids that come to our showcases that ask me personally for help, that, that I see every day that I meet in seminars like this who, who are in that position of almost graduating. Can they get a scholarship? Absolutely. But are you ready to put in the work and understand the system and follow it and be successful? A lot of people don't like to follow the system. There is a, a winning game plan which I'm providing you guys with. And if you spend a lot of time listening to everybody else, you might get very confused. And so when you, you start to get confused because you start to then compare yourself to your friend or another family that went through the process and, oh, you know, Jimmy got a full ride to University of Arkansas and he just sent out two emails and his coach did this for him. Guys, first of all, it's rarely that easy. And if it was, maybe it was for them. But everybody is different. Everybody has different needs and wants. There are academic standards and majors that you want to study and a career that you want to have that may be totally different from the other person. Your financial situation might be totally different. Your level of tennis might be totally different. Your level of commitment, your location, all these factors will come into play. You might not get along with the team. The coach may not like you. You may not like the coach. So a really good piece of advice is, is certainly you can listen to what others are, are doing and saying, but it seems like the more you start following that process and not your own pathway, you get lost somewhere down the line. So, number four, coaches evaluate prospects online and in person. Okay, with, with competition these days and the amount of players that are seeking those thousand plus scholarship spots each year. It's really important to build relationships. You know, for the parents out here, I think you can relate to the college recruiting process very much so like finding a job, seeking a job. And so the best thing we can do for the student athletes is help them with that process and understand that relationships are really important and meeting college coaches and getting yourself a competitive edge. So there are opportunities, less so for internationals than there are for Americans, but as an international, you've got to find the opportunities to get in front of college coaches. And you have to do that often. You've got to be on their radar. One of my good friends was the head coach at University of South Florida. Now he got the head men's job at, at um, Arizona State University. And so I did an interview with him two years back, I think. And um, one of the questions I asked him was, you know, when do you evaluate prospects and when do you put them on your list? And he said ninth and 10th grade. And I said, well, how can a kid who may be a little bit older get on your list? And he said, it's very difficult because I've spent the time in investing in the time and money investing in those players and watching them and going to visit them or having them see me or just following them. And so that's one side of it where a school like Arizona State is really really a high level university that plays sort of at the top of the top. So that school has a lot of money to spend on traveling and meeting players and stuff, but it's also difficult to get on their radar. So you need to start developing your relationships with college coaches early, even if it's at a school that's not you know top 10, top 20 in the country. Uh, they have limited resources. And those limited resources don't allow them to travel and see you. So you almost have to be where they are. You kind of have to chase them. And if you see them, you'll develop that relationship. There are also lines of communication that you can't cross at certain times, but you're still able to send them messages. They're able to keep you on their radar. They're able to put you on their list. So when the time comes to get recruited and you have met them, you have understood what 
requirements they need to get into their university, that you're well prepared and that you have a relationship with that person or that co those set of coaches. Coaches also like to, to get information from players, you know, their profile, their video, which I'm gonna talk about, about the seven steps. So understanding that things are done online, understanding that meeting coaches is really important for your development too, to understand, you know, what types of schools you may be interested in. So, you know, a couple years ago, I realized how important that was for both coaches and players, and we developed um, collegiate camps, which we started running at the University of Pennsylvania. And so what these camps do is players come, they stay at the University of Pennsylvania, and they get to live on campus, they get to meet with 20 plus coaches that we have on staff, and the camp is fully staffed by college coaches. So you get to develop your game, you get to understand the different levels of college tennis, you get to meet coaches in a more relaxed and comfortable setting. They're coaching you on the drills and the type of techniques and skills that they look for in college players. And then you meet a ton of kids, you get great competition, there's lots of motivational seminars. So when we started this, we thought it would be great. It turned out to be a great hit. And players that come to those events, now that we've been tracking them, have really done a handful of things. They either connected with a coach, and, or, or two, or three, or four, and had some scholarship opportunities. They've had the opportunity to experience what it would be like and the intensity that, and, and that college coaches are running their practices and how the environment would be like, because they get to stay on campus and live in a dorm. They get that experience. Or they get to realize that maybe college tennis is not for them. And that they're just happy playing tennis, but not at that level with that amount of commitment and requirements on the you know, on that side. So those opportunities have become very good for players and um, there are other events and other camps that, that do it around the country. And uh, I think that for the youngsters, especially coming through now or anybody who's, who's still got some more time in the process, that that would be something you should look at. Because while we're in Canada, we're really familiar but unfamiliar with how the universities work. So like when I went down to the States, like I had this picture in my head, like, hey, you know, it's gonna be like this and there's gonna be, you know, football games and all this stuff. And, and there was to some extent, but it was completely different than what I expected, but in a good way. But I wasn't really prepared for it. I went in my first year of college and I barely passed my classes. I just wasn't really ready and understood, I couldn't get my head around what, what, you know, how it worked. I couldn't understand you know, that there was tennis and that it took a lot of time and I had to study and I had to manage my time well and sacrifice social time and get it all done. So I find that players who, who get exposed to those opportunities really understand a little bit better and get some taste of what it's like rather than possibly failing out of your first semester, which is very close for me. But you know, I rebounded very quickly and I understood it. But had I had a little bit of, of understanding ahead of time, I feel like I would have been a little bit well prepared. So I think the players can really prepare for that well. So, the last thing is you, student athlete, must be in charge of your recruiting process. I mentioned this. Parents, what's your role? Parents, you need to be guiding your son or daughter through the recruiting process as being their supporter, helping them and advising them when and where needed, but you are not to be writing emails for them. You are not to be selecting the colleges for them. You are not to be doing everything for them. Because it's just not gonna help. College coaches do not like to hear from parents. They don't. They wanna hear from the athletes. They wanna get to know the athlete. They wanna know that the athlete is gonna be prepared and ready to come and be part of a college team by the time that they enter. 
that they are learning the skills. And you know, parents, you, you gotta make sure that you should not be afraid if your son or daughter makes any mistakes because there is really no mistake you can make in the recruiting process that's gonna like detriment you, know, you getting a scholarship unless you do something completely wild. But you know, there's nothing really you can say or do wrong. And a lot of people think that, oh, you know, don't say this, don't do that. No, let them learn. Coaches understand that these are young kids, young adults, that they're 15, 16, 17, 18 years old, and that they're growing and that they're learning, but they want to be able to make sure that they're ready for college. And I think it's a great thing to do because I think it really does help you. I think it prepares you for life. I think it prepares you for a career. It gives you a head start in understanding how to communicate and talk to people and be in uncomfortable situations, especially if that's something that you're shy about. But at the same time, parents need to make sure that they play their role, which is the supporter, the financial partner in the process. <laughs> and that you let the kids really find where they should feel like they're right. And, um, and it's definitely your job to advise and to, and to make oversee the process, but not to do the process. So when I work with student athletes, that's the first thing I, I, I pretty much come out with once we've sort of done an overview, is like, you know, as a parent, I need you to be there to like make sure, you know, Jimmy is doing his stuff and that, you know, the assignments I've given him, like that he's on top of it, that he's that you're helping him manage his time. Uh, but I, I don't want to see the work coming from you. And sometimes there's some parents that say, oh no, I didn't do anything, and I see the email, and it's pretty clear that Jimmy didn't write that email. So, you know, it, it's really just gonna hurt you as a family. That's the main thing. And um, it's not really teaching your the kids the skills that they need to learn because they'll really be having a rough time their first semester in college. So let's go to the seven steps, okay? All right, number one, this is, this is the stuff I think you really, really wanna hear, is okay, how am I gonna get a scholarship? Well, number one, you gotta create a winning game plan. So a winning game plan comes from a couple things. Number one, you need to understand where your level of tennis is. Is anyone familiar with UTR? Universal tennis rating, who, by show of hands, put your hands up high if you're familiar with UTR. Okay, so maybe almost half, okay, and, and everyone else is not. Okay, so universal tennis rating, I, sorry for those people who already know about it, but universal tennis rating is a system that's been around for a while but has recently gained a lot of popularity because their system's been perfected where it gives a universal rating for every single player who's playing competitive tennis. And that goes all the way from Serena Williams and Novak Djokovic and all the pro players on the tour, all the way down to a men's open or women's open player or a men's over 45, whatever you wanna call it. Anyone who's playing competitively in a federation or association. So what that means is that you're getting rated and the rating's actually fairly accurate. It's about 98% roughly accurate. And the reason for that is because everybody's rated and their numbers are in there and there's an algorithm that really works. And you guys can read up more about UTR and how that system works and you can read all the facts, but because it does and because they have a partnership with the ITA, the Intercollegiate Tennis Association, every college player is rated on that system. So the best way for you to really find out where you fit and where your level is, is based on the UTR system. Because you can actually check where you fit versus the college players on a specific team. And in a minute, I'll ask Peter to just bring the, the board up and I'm gonna show you guys real quickly how that UTR system works so you guys can get a little bit of a visual. So whenever you get a chance, that's fine. Um, The other parts of the recruiting game plan include your academics and how good those are and how good your SAT scores are. Everyone familiar with SAT scores? Anybody not? Raise a hand high if you don't know what the SAT is. Okay, SAT is like an aptitude test that you must take to get into a US university. 
Is everyone familiar with the ACT? Show of hands who's not familiar with ACT. Okay, ACT is another test, an aptitude test, that you can take in place of the SAT. So you're able to take one or both, see which one you're better at. But those test requirements, every single university requires you to take, unless you're a transfer student. So you have to take that test. And it's not always an indication about how smart you are or not, but it certainly is one of their requirements. And that is a portion of if you get admitted into university or not. And so as much as college coaches would like to try to help you get into a college, and often they might be able to, or they can, um, you still have to meet some, some requirements there. So knowing where you fit academically is important, which types of schools you can target. The third piece is the financial piece. This is really, really important. A family has to set a certain amount of dollars, money, aside that they're willing and able to spend on their son or daughter's education. Knowing the facts that I told you earlier about the scholarships and how many are available, and if you're not somebody that fits as a girl into the eight full rides, or the six, or you're not a guy that's getting ATP points or top 50 ITF or better, the possibility of paying close to zero or zero is, is, is the reality. So how much you're willing and able to put aside is important to know because that's going to determine which types of schools fit you. And so you don't want to waste a lot of time going to colleges where you may not fit, where the cost of the university is fifty or 60000 and they're only going to be able to give you ten or twenty if that's not in your range, versus schools that may give you more. And so the only way to kind of find that out is, is really doing the legwork and figuring it out. By going on a website and seeing that a school costs $60,000 is not always going to determine how much aid you're going to get. Quite often, a lot of the schools that even charge more than other schools, the cost is actually gives you more aid. So certainly people like myself who do it on a daily basis, who are educated in the business and, and have the experience and, and knowledge dealing with, with hundreds of universities, um, certainly we can, we can guide you and help you with that. But in order for you to create that winning game plan, you need to have those three sections, especially in order so that when you go, you can start finding out which schools fit or don't. If you don't have a game plan, you're really going to be all over the place. You just cannot, you, you'll, you'll, you'll be talking to hundreds of schools, you won't even be able to manage the communication, you don't even know where to go from there. So you definitely have to have that understood ahead of time. And you know, things can change a little bit, you know? If a school is going to cost you a couple thousand dollars more or less, you can evaluate that as you go along, but you definitely have to have some idea of what, you got, what you're looking for. So I'm just going to go back to this UTR real quick since um, Peter was kind enough to, to put this up for me. So, okay. So I have here, okay, well I have here, sorry if, you, if I've got to move this. And everybody, I'll move out of the way, but okay. So we have your University of Tennessee. I just, I guess I had it up. So here we're looking at the men's team at University of Tennessee, okay? And so one way to find your fit athletically or, or get an idea of what level you need to be at, if that is one of your schools you want to go to, is to look here. Now this number right here is really important, your power six spread. That is the top six players on the team that are in the top six lineup and their range of UTR. So it's the lowest player there, the number six player is a 12.47, and their number one player is a 13.7. And then you can start to see down here, you know, the different players and their ratings. And if you click the players, you can see their match results and who they're playing. So that, import, that number's important to understand where you might fit, okay? Now, I can grab a player here and, um, let me see if I have some saved players. Oops. Sorry about that.
All right, here we go. So. So let's just take this kid right here, for example, from, from Florida, Miami. So this is Jonathan. He's actually in college right now. I helped him go to University of North Florida. Jonathan's a 1244. So, and you can see some of his results there. His reliability is 100%. That means that all his matches have been reliable in the system, and he's been playing reliable players. Um, there's no discrepancy over there. And um, you can find out where you fit. So as a 12-4-4, and then you go back to University of Tennessee. And we go back to this player side on the men. He's slightly off, but he's pretty much, you know, 0.3 points is not really going to tell you you can't play there. But he looks like he would be, you know, around the bottom of the lineup if he was to come in right away. And so you can take everything with a grain of salt. Obviously, you know, you don't have to use this to a T, but it gives you a very, very, very good idea of where you stand. And as I mentioned, these college players are very accurate because they're playing in that league and it's being, being recorded. Now the UTR is being very accurate for, for tournaments that you'll be playing in. OTA tournaments, Tennis Canada tournaments, ITF tournaments. They're all being recorded in there. That's right, right, Kartik? So since they're all recorded in there, you're getting a much better understanding of your level and where you need to be. So one will ask me, well, let's say I'm a 10 right now. How do I get to a 12 or a 12.5 if I'm a guy? Or let's say I'm a 7 or 8 for a girl. And how do I get to a 9 or a 10? Well, first of all, you've got to beat those players that are 9s and 10s. <laughs> That's basically how it goes down. So, you know, as you come and you're playing matches and you're playing a tournament, you should be looking up the players' UTRs. So let's say you go to a tournament and you're into the third round or fourth round. And now all of a sudden you're going to play a player and you're going to look up their UTR and it's, let's say you're a 9 and they're a 9-3 or a 9-5. You got to remember that that's a match that you want to win. That's a match that you've got to really put in your head and say, I got to win that match and try to win that match without putting the pressure on, but just understanding that those are the matches that you need to win to get yourself to the next level. It's no different than anybody else competing. It's no different than the pros, you know? If somebody's going into the semis, or the quarters of a tournament, and they're not in the top two or three, you know, and they playing Serena Williams, for example, like, you gotta win that match, right? That's the match you wanna win to get to the next level. So this is a good way for you guys to start to understand where you fit as well as how you can start improving your level and your rating. Yeah. All right, we can basically turn that off. All right, so the next one over here is talking about creating a profile in a video. Yeah, you can turn the lights back on. Thanks. Um, profile and video. Okay, so there's a specific profile and video that you need to create now. College coaches are busy. They're getting more emails than they ever did before. Some of them are getting 100, 200, 300 a month. And so the information that you need to provide a college coach is the basic requirement information for them to vet whether you are a somebody that meets their requirements or does not meet their requirements. So actually, Cardiac, what I'm gonna do is, is once I get the emails from, from the players over here, I'm actually gonna send everybody a little recruiting package and that's gonna include a little example of, of the profile that everyone can make. And it's very simple, you know, it includes a name and your UTR and your test scores your SAT scores, et cetera. And that gives a coach an idea based on some of your basic information where you stand. The worst thing you can do is send a coach an email that is like a page long and tells your life story. <laughs> They're not gonna read it. Because the first thing they wanna do is find out whether you go and call them A or call them B. 
whether, whether you, those requirements meet or do not meet. Because if they meet, then they're certainly going to want to know more about you. And at that time, you can tell them all about yourself and why you'd be a good candidate and why you think you should, you should be recruited for that team. And they're interested to know, but there's just not enough time for them to do that. And unfortunately, if you're going after a college that where you don't meet those requirements or you're not close to meeting those requirements, um, the coach... The coach is not going to be interested and the only way to get them to be interested is to come back with, with those requirements when you can. So creating a profile is, is kind of like a resume these days. You're just adding in the very basic highlighted information that gets their attention. Now the video. This is probably the most important thing. So I'd like everybody to pay close attention. A college video no longer requires you to make a fancy edited video. I used to do college recruiting videos for players up until about almost two years ago. But as technology has shown us and changed and the development of UTR and other ratings and rankings and College coaches want to see an unedited video of match play against another player that's competitive. Not a coach, not a friend who's used to play tennis, but somebody that is competing right now, either in college or as a junior, who has a similar or better UTR than you do. Preferably better. So that you can show that coach that you can play. What's even better, is filming a real match. If everybody wants to make a note real quick, mytennistools.com. If you don't know about those camera poles that you can stick on top of the fence, you can film a match from like a TV-like view. I think everybody should be filming matches regardless. Like if I, if I was a junior right now, I would film every single one of my matches and I'd watch them. And I'd analyze them. I mean, that's a great way to just improve your game. And it's so easy now. It's simple. It's the little cameras that you can buy as cheap as $50, a camera pull for 50 bucks, $100 investment for something that you'll use. You can use it forever. In fact, sometimes I go out and play with my friends and I still film it just for fun. We play a match. Still want to improve my game. But as a junior, that should, be, that should be what you should be doing. And every time that you play a good match against someone with a better UTR and you beat them, put that up on YouTube. Put it on your profile. And you should do that consistently. Your profile and your video should auto constantly be updating over the, over the few years that you're, be, you're doing your recruiting process. If your ratings improved, if your grades have improved, if your SAT scores have improved, if your game has improved, the best way to show it is through match footage, unedited match video. And coaches, they really won't look at anything else. They do not, they don't like that edited video. They're not sure who's playing, what, what's going on, are you really winning all the points, are you not? It's too fabricated. And they want to be able to see the results so they can see when you put up a match video that you're playing, it's nothing more real than that. So. That's very, very important. And that's one of the things that I think people have not yet really understood. And you're going to get a long ways when you show that video. Yeah, so sure. So what's the right duration of the video in each of them? I don't think you can put in a two hours, three hours over there. It's uh, the coaches willing to. Yeah, coaches, you know what the coach is going to do? Yeah, so he, his question right there, if people didn't hear it, if I understood right, was, was how long is the duration of the video, right? So I said a match video. I mean, honestly, you can put the whole thing up. But here's what the coach is going to do. He's, he or she is going to watch a portion of the video, probably about five to seven minutes, and they're going to use that to determine whether they want to continue to recruit you or not, along with your profile. So your profile gives you the information, and then you get the, the image, the visual, and it gives the coach an idea. That's all it's doing. So basically that's the entire match. So you can put the entire match up. You can put a setup, but at least put something unedited. Okay, thank you. Yeah, no problem. So let's go to number three. Registering with NCAA, NAIA, 
Eligibility Centers, SAT. So for everyone in here who doesn't know, NCAA is the National Collegiate Athletic Association. This association is like the NFL, the NBA, the NHL. It's the governing body that governs all sports though. And everybody has to register with them to be eligible to play college sports who is in that league. And I mentioned there's one other league, but the large majority are in NCAA Division One, Two, or Three. And so to get it cleared to play, you gotta meet their requirements. Their requirements are not very difficult to meet, but they wanna make sure basically where you're coming from, have you played professionally, that you are a competitive player that has followed the rules of amateurism. And you have not taken large sums of money and played on the pro tour and somebody is getting you know, a former top you know, 200 WTA or ITP player. So that is a system that you can start doing as early as grade 10 or even beginning of 11. You know, you have to fill in all the information. It's pretty self-explanatory. It's step by step and they give you tasks to do, but you gotta stay on top of it and you have to get it done. The best thing you can do though is get a number, which as soon as you register, you get an NCAA number and you attach that as part of your profile. Because college coaches need to have that information to give it, if they start recruiting you, they need that information to give to their athletic department to show that they have a valid recruit that they're recruiting. The stuff doesn't need to be done, but you need to be in the system. The NAI, as I mentioned, was is another organization that formed not too long ago, but has, I think, about 100 plus member schools. And so these colleges are, are around the United States and they have a great league and they still compete against division one, two, three and NCAA schools during the regular season. They have their own conference, they have their own conference matches, their own tournament, but it's a very, very competitive program. It's just as competitive as NCAA division one, two and three schools. So taking the option of the NAIA is not bad. If it fits within your requirements, your interests, if there's coaches there that are recruiting you, um, it's a great program. And really no different than the NCAA. It's very well organized. And um, I don't think that anybody should limit themselves because the experience you're getting is the same. SATs, ACTs, and then I wrote TOEFL as well. Anybody here um, go to a non-English speaking school, like a French school, immersion, anybody? You do? Okay, well I'll touch on the TOEFL. The TOEFL exam is taken as an English proficiency test for somebody who is attending a non-English speaking school. So they wanna know that whether you speak the language or not. And in Canada, majority of us are good at both languages, if, if, that's, if we're studying in a, in a French uh, immersion or a different language. Um, but that is a required test. It's not difficult, but you have to take it. And colleges will tell you what their minimum requirements are to get on that test. Um, that test can be taken in junior, senior year. Um, quite often I tell people to wait to take that test until they're getting recruited by certain schools and then understanding what their requirements are. But if you're good at, you know, if your English is fluent, then you can take it whenever you want and I'm sure you'll get a great score. The SAT and ACT test, okay. The SAT test, I, I told you those are aptitude tests. And so the SAT comprises of two sections. Um, there used to be an old system, now it got replaced. Uh, an old system, what I use, and it got replaced with a new system. And now it's again, kind of like the old system, but a hybrid. So it's out of 1600 points. The math is out of 800, the reading and writing is out of 800. And you are to take that test and different universities will require you to get different scores. If I was to give you a good idea of the score you should be aiming to get is 1200 points or better, okay? That would be somewhere where majority of universities will accept you into their schools at that. Whether you'll get academic money or not, that all depends on the universities. But that is at least the goal that I would aim for. If you get less than that, not a big deal a lot of schools will take you based on those scores, especially if your uh, GPA is high. But that is what I would aim for. On the ACT, that's not as popular here in Canada, but it's quite popular in the United States and in other countries. And that is also another test that you can take, which is an aptitude test. It has 
various sections of math and science and so on. You can research that on your phone and go on their website. But that's out of 36 points. And so a good ACT score that you would want to try to get is around a 28 or better. Okay? And again, if you get a lower score than that, it's no problem. But that score usually allows you to get you know, an opportunity to get some academic scholarships. So how do you study for those tests? When do you take those tests? I suggest taking those tests, and I suggest taking both of them, if you can, to see which one you test better in, and then choosing that one to, to, to continue on. But I would take that in my grade 11 year, my first semester of grade 11. Because you'll get an idea of where you stand. At that point, you'll be talking to some college coaches or starting your process. And when you start getting further in your process with coaches and finding out who's recruiting you, they're going to either let you know that that score is fine or you need to improve that score. Now you have a year to improve that score. If you start taking it your senior year, you put a lot of pressure on yourself because you might have taken the test in October, November, you start connecting with coaches, January, February, and then all of a sudden you might have one or two opportunities to take it. They do not offer the test all the time. You can go online and check it out, but they offer it in September, October, November, December, January, then again March, then again May. I think they added one in June, but then, but you know, that might be a little bit difficult and late. So you can go online and check when the various tests is, but that's when I would be taking the test. Um, we're at number four, right? Uh, the create a realistic list of programs and contact them. So, you know, based on what I talked about, about your financial situation, the academics, the athletics, we're creating a list of realistic programs that you think may fit based on the tools that you're using. So by creating that realistic list, now you want to contact those coaches with your profile and video to get an initial communication and seek interest. When you're seeking interest, you're going to then be able to sift out you know, which colleges are interested and uninterested. Hopefully you'll get some response back from the colleges that aren't and know why. You know, often coaches don't have a lot of time to tell you exactly why, but um, it's not a bad idea to ask them, you know, coach, thanks for your email. I'm sorry, you know, that I don't fit or, or uh, it's not possible, but you know, what type of player are you looking for? And sometimes they'll give you an indication of the academic and athletic level. In other words, the UTR level and the academic requirements on the SAT and, and grades that they're looking for. And that gives you an idea to maybe check back with them if you can obtain that or not. So managing your contact communication is really, really important. That's going into number five. Is the hardest thing that I find that athletes and parents have is managing the communication. So a couple of people were asking me some questions and um, uh, some of them were asking me about you know, our business and how it works. So uh, I, I guess I can slot in here. Is, well, since I've realized over the last nine years how difficult it can sometimes be to manage those emails and a lot of text messages and different platforms that we use to manage communication um, we've been developing a, a recruiting app that allows athletes and coaches to communicate on our platform where it's kind of like a CRM, a customer resource management system. We call it a recruiting management system where you can send a message to a coach, they can reply and that communication stays within the platform and within that university. So you can click back and say, you know, I'm communicating with the University of Florida and you know, here's the, the five messages that we sent back and forth to each other and you can leave where you left off because sometimes you're doing some initial contact and coaches aren't ready you maybe you're not ready to reach back to them and you can lose track of it you know and if you aren't using something like that in the meantime you know I think it's a really good idea to be using your email and creating folders and putting those emails that you have with those coaches in their university folders so that you're not just going through your emails realizing where that last email went and I think like that's where parents, you can really help your students get organized with that kind of stuff and make sure that they're on top of it. Because it can get busy, especially when recruiting season's going around and everybody is looking for players. Coaches start messaging you and you might get 10, 20, 30, 40 emails. Um, number six is your college application and visits. So once that you have made contact with coaches, there's interest, you guys have been talking back and forth, 
there comes a time when the coach asks you to complete an application and start the process to pursue it a little bit further. If it's a school that you're really interested in, then you should complete an application. There are a few different types of applications. One is a specific school application. These days, a lot of schools do a common application. So it's a common login that you can go in. All your information stays stored. And there's a specific code that goes to that school. And that gets sent to them. And from there, and an application, they're usually looking to make a visit. So you want to understand a little bit about the school in terms of what potential scholarship you might get out of that university what it's going to look like, what they can do for you, what a visit's going to look like. There's two types of visits. There's official visits and unofficial visits. And official visits is where a school brings you on for 48 hours, and they take care of you, and they, they house you with one of the players, and they can pay for their meals and all this stuff. Some schools can pay for your flights. It's usually the very, very big schools at the highest level because they have big recruiting budgets. But regardless of the case, what happens is that you're going on an official visit that's documented by the university. You have five that you can take in Division One, and then two, and then three doesn't matter. NAI uh, doesn't have any requirements there either. But those are some rules that I'll send you guys as well. But when you go on those visits, the idea is for you to check out the school and check out the team and um, see if academically and athletically this school fits for you. And so once you take a visit and you fill in your application, you get a bunch of opportunities. And you've done two, three, four visits, which by the way, I don't recommend anybody going to a college without taking a visit. It's really, really important. And knowing the players on the team and having a chemistry with them is really, really important as well. So once you do that stuff, it's decision making time, which is number six. And uh, I write there, you know, it's not a four year decision, it's a lifetime decision. And the reason for that is honestly, when, you, when you're going to play on a college tennis scholarship in the US, you're going to another country, you might be paying some money to go there. Maybe as much as you pay here, maybe more, because you're buying into the fact that you're getting something special out of it. You're getting to be a student athlete. You're getting to travel. You're getting to excel in your sport. You're getting to meet new people. You're getting new experiences. And you're getting a competitive edge and an opportunity. There's a lot of employers that love to hire college athletes. And the reason why they like to is because they know that they're able to take pressure, face adversity, be team players, handle commitment, responsibility, all the things that come with being an athlete. And I think that the connections that you make over there are, are big. So I got my opportunities through college tennis. I got to work for the Orlando Magic basketball team because Otis Smith, who was a general manager of the Orlando Magic at the time I was there. And I, he and I were alumni of Jacksonville University. He was an alumni. He played basketball there. And that was my connection. I sent probably over 400 applications to every single sports team in the country. I wanted to be working for a professional sports team, whether it was hockey, baseball, basketball, whatever. And that was the only one I got an interview with and the only one job I got. And it wasn't that I wasn't qualified. Obviously, I wouldn't have got the job if I wasn't qualified. But it was through a connection. And the universities are often looking to help student athletes because you're the ambassadors of the school. You're, you're who's going to talk about the school, wear the school colors and the shirts when you're outside campus and on campus and for the rest of your life. The universities in the US have a really strong culture and pride. When I went to the Orlando Magic, there was people there that would like deck out their entire office with like Florida State football stuff and University of Miami or Texas or wherever they went to school. And it kind of follows you. And it does here too, but the sports part really follows you. And so they're really looking to help the, the athletes a lot. You know, I had an opportunity with Fidelity Financial as well that I just decided not to take, but they are invested in, in making sure that you have a, a career path afterwards. And uh, part of it is you taking the initiative and part of it the university. So when you're making a decision, when you're trying to find out whether it's a good opportunity or not, you have to look at all those angles and you get those at the visit. You know, those are the questions you should be asking. You 
should be meeting with whatever department that that of major that you want to study, whether it's psychology or medicine or business, and finding out what connections they have, what opportunities they can give to you, and if that fits with your needs and wants. So the decision making really shapes you. I mean, the, the players on my team, I'm still friends with today. I'm still very good friends with. I went and visited one of them in Austria last year with my wife. Um, I went to Australia, I've been to Germany, I've been in the, around the US. I've gotten connections and job opportunities and, and relationships for my business and just good friendship out of the people that you meet there. So, you know, knowing who's on your team and having a good relationship and, and a feeling from them is really important. So it really does affect your entire life and your career. And it's really something why I got into the business because of helping kids get recruited. A, I saw there was a lot of problems of kids who could have gone and sh wanted to go but really didn't know how to do it. And I found there wasn't a lot of information and real experts who really spent their time educating people about it and understanding how it works because it's a full-time job. And someone who says they know three or four or five coaches, it's not really gonna help you because you may end up at the wrong university and you really don't take advantage of the opportunity. But I also do it because I loved my experience. My experience was unbelievable. And truthfully, I went to two schools. I went to Western New Mexico, which was a Division II school. I had a very good team, but I grew out of that school. And partially I did it because I was a little late in the process myself. And I wasn't sure if I wanted to go, but once I took the opportunity, I had the time of my life. And I transferred because I had an injury. I was looking to do something with my career once I realized tennis wasn't going to be the rest of my life and I wanted to go somewhere where I could grow a little bit more. And that happens sometimes. Had I been a little bit more diligent in the process and known more about it, maybe I would have done it, but I also was at a certain level in my academics in tennis where that was a great start for me. But the bottom line is that you know it's such an amazing experience. It's such an awesome, cool, fun opportunity, and you become part of a community and part of a team that you could never really get anywhere else. And I'm a proud Canadian, and I, I see a lot of my friends who went down there, came back. I'm one of the few that ended up staying there, but I still come back here very often. It's still my home, and it's, it's not going to change. But it definitely is a unique opportunity that I think that everybody here should take advantage of, and if they can. But it requires a lot of hard work, a lot of dedication, a lot of long hours on the tennis court, off the tennis court. So I want everyone to understand how much of a privilege it is to be one of those selected student athletes. But when you are one, it's a lot of fun. So thanks very much, guys, for hearing me out today. I hope you guys learned a lot.